Hi, I'm Lisa Turkers. Welcome to Therapy and Theology with my good friends and ministry partners, Joel Mutamale. He's the Director of Theological Research at Proverbs 31 Ministries and my personal counselor, Jim Kress. Welcome, you guys. I know today we have a very important topic to cover. We've been in a series on forgiveness because we are celebrating the release of the book that I've written, Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Mm. And I know both of us, uh, all together, we've spent countless hours working on forgiveness. Both Joel, you and I have worked on it in the studying of God's Word and really seeking to understand what God's Word does and does not say yeah. about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Mm -hmm. So we already had a session on that. If you missed that, we'll put a link so you can go back and listen to that one. But you don't have to stop today's in order to uh, get into this topic. You can dive right in and go back and listen to the previous episode um, after this episode. And Jim, mm -hmm. you and I have spent many hours working on forgiveness from a counseling therapeutic standpoint. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate both of you adding your voices to this important discussion. Yeah. Today, we're going to be talking about the cure for a heavy heart. I think all of us, well, I, I don't want to put this on you. I'm just going to give you an opportunity. Put it on Joe. Okay. Right. I'm going to give you an <laughs> opportunity to say, we can all do it at the same time. Okay. If you have ever had one of those times in your life where it's not that there's something big and traumatic happening in the moment, but you wake up on what could be a really good day, but you feel like there is this unexplainable heaviness in your heart. So raise your hand if you've ever been there. I got two. Yeah. Yes. For sure. yeah. Me too. I'll, tell you that I'll right do now. two. Me too, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. And um, I think that there are many contributing factors when someone has a heavy heart. I know for me, my natural bent is I'm a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And when there are situations in my life that I feel like I can't get to that place of peace. Um, then it just creates a lot of heaviness and it feels like a constant distraction to me all day. Mm. Um, and so sometimes I can point directly to the reason why I'm feeling this heaviness. Other mm -hmm. times I can't. Other times I wake up and I feel heavy and I, I'm not even exactly sure why it's there. But when we are studying forgiveness, one place in the Bible that I found to be so interesting is when Jesus told the disciples, let me tell you how to pray. Like this is then how you should pray. And in Matthew chapter six, we find the recording of what Jesus then said, starting in verse nine, this is then how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And as I read that, I'm struck by a couple of things. Number one, if... I was given the task by God to write one succinct prayer that for all time would teach people <laughs> yeah. how to pray. I'm not sure that I would have thought to write it so brilliantly like Jesus wrote it. Right. And I'm afraid that if I was given the task, I was not, thank goodness, but if I was given this task, I probably would not have thought to put in confession and forgiveness and make that the bulk of the focus of the prayer. Mm. And so because Jesus did, if you count up the words, there are the majority of the words in this prayer that Jesus says, this is then how you should pray, they're dedicated to uh, confession, forgiveness, deliverance from the evil one, 
and then a warning on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And there's not a real clear break. Like, was that last little part part yeah. of the prayer or was he just giving a commentary? Mm -hmm. To me, that's kind of an irrelevant question because it's all right there together. Mm -hmm. And it's all still in the words of Jesus. And so I feel like so much when Jesus was teaching us to pray is focused on confession and forgiveness. There must be a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And as I decided to start implementing confession and forgiveness as a more daily routine, it started to lift some of the heaviness in my heart. Mm -hmm. And I started to think to myself, wow, I've never been taught this before. I've never been taught that the daily cure for heaviness in our heart is confession and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot. Uh, there's yeah. a lot. I think one very personally, just the last um, couple of weeks, uh, I had a friend who is walking through a really difficult season in their marriage. Um, been married seven years, got three kids, um, and he found out some things that uh, he was uh, horrified um, at. And his wife and, uh, and him, they're, they're working through the realities of forgiveness, uh, betrayal, trust rebuilding. And it was really interesting, my friend said, uh, just the other day he called and said, I realized that there were a lot of things that I had been doing that I wasn't aware of until my wife made me aware of it. Mm. And I find myself during the day randomly where those things will just pop into my mind. And when they pop into my mind, I stop what I do and I just go to her and I just confess that. I say, I'm so sorry for being short with you. Or I, and, and then she responds in this awkward, am I supposed to say something back? Because <laughs> we're just yeah. you know, making dinner, making lunch. Um, but he used that exact same phrase, Lisa. He said, it took a heaviness from my heart off and it replaced it with a sense of being able to really connect. Um, and I think that there's a beauty there that takes place mm. with confession that Jesus is trying to teach us and he gets at. A couple quick notes about this. Why is it that Jesus, uh, you brought this up so brilliantly, why use these words? Well, why these sentences? Why this structure? One of the things that I love about the Lord's Prayer is that the Lord says all the things that he has enacted in his earthly ministry. Wow. So think about that, that the Lord is saying, um, give us our daily bread. Well, Jesus himself gave daily bread. You know, um, he says, forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Jesus knows he's coming to the cross where he's going to do that judicial declaring of, um, uh, of, of people being uh, mm -hmm. free of their guilt. Lead us on to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus is the one who delivered uh, the people of uh, Israel, the people of God, from a greater enemy than Pharaoh in Egypt, which is what they would have thought when they're saying deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. They're thinking the Red Sea. Right. They're thinking this is our pastoral, and this is what Jesus is doing. And then, how would the people who are hearing this, how, what are they thinking of when they hear something like debts? I think sometimes we miss this, but the majority of the hearers of that time are people who are borrowing, not lending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are steeped in debt. They are steeped mm -hmm. in the reality that some cases they can't pay this back. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is giving them a model um, for this extravagant forgiveness that is modeled by Jesus himself. And he's going to show that in the cross coming up. And Jim, mm -hmm. I know you and I have talked about, I, we, we think it's interesting that when forgiveness is mentioned here, the weight of the offense is referred to as a debt. Mm -hmm. Well, and we have referenced now many times in these series of, of podcasts and videos that one of the words afiemi in Greek means to cancel the debt. And as we've talked a lot about fact and impact, fact this is what you did, but how much is the debt? Credit card companies do it all the time. If they were to write off debt or they're trying to assess you, where are you with your mm -hmm. credit score? How much is the debt? So what's the weight? Is it a $5 debt or a $5 million debt? But the, the weightiness of what is the debt that as we go to forgive, and sometimes that just takes time for me to even be in touch with, well, how, how, how big is this for me? How much has this bothered me? What is the size of the debt? Mm. And I think as we assess the hurt that we've been through, yeah. um, and so much of the reason why we even bring up the topic of forgiveness is it's attached to 
something has happened. Somebody has done something that has caused us pain. And because of that, there was an emotional, maybe even a financial, maybe even a physical cost. But regardless, there was a cost. Somebody did something that cost us a lot. And I think when you and I have talked, Jim, about we make the decision to forgive for the facts of what happened. Right. Then we also have to walk through the process of forgiveness to better assess and understand how to forgive the impact, not mm -hmm. just the facts of what That's happened right. originally, mm -hmm. but the impact of what the effect has been, what the cost has been to us because of the action. So we can forgive the action, but the process of forgiveness is going to be a much longer process because sometimes we don't even know the full impact of how this is going to affect us or, or what this will cost us. I mean, it leaks into our life for years and years and years to come. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to recognize when we become aware, oh, there's actually more debt here, or oh, yeah. there's actually a bigger cost here than what I realized, or oh, I'm now having emotions that are a direct tie back to the original event that hurt me. But now these emotions have leaked into my life and they're affecting me today. This mm -hmm. could have happened, the fact could have happened years and years and That's years right. ago. But the impact is still affecting me. So it's important to understand we forgive for the fact and then we go through the process of forgiveness and that process may take years and years and years. True. The process of forgiving the impact as we become aware of the emotional cost that this has had to us just because we now have to forgive the impact, that doesn't negate the original decision right. to forgive. Mm -hmm. right. The original decision to forgive is there and it's secure, but forgiving the impact happens over time. And it's, yeah. it's I, a decision and a process. I, I like both of those and it's like calling the forgiveness adjuster. Everybody's had a car wreck, first thing you do, call the insurance, they're gonna send an adjuster. And you go to the body shop and they're gonna give an estimate of what the damage is. Oh, they gotta look under the car. Damage to the chassis. Everybody that's driven a car knows this. Or hail damage or something on a house. The adjuster comes out and says, what is the extent? I don't know, a couple of whole, no, you need a whole new roof. Mm -hmm. So that forgiveness adjuster, as we do this work, I especially have been able to do that uh, with people in counseling, is let's just stop and look at the impact. And I even say naming, not blaming. We're not here to do blame work of people. Blame is often an attempt to discharge pain and discomfort, but it's to say, what has this cost me? And to go back to another thing you said a moment ago, remember, as you land your plane of harm on a person's runway, that runway was built before you, and so we always want to uh, assess the, uh, the post-traumatic stress part that you are hurting a person and that can open up old unhealed wounds or maybe scars that have healed it's often a buy one, get two or three free. Wow, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think we also need to incorporate the awareness here that Jesus intended for this to be a daily prayer. Right. Not good. When yeah. he says, give us today our daily bread, Joel, would you agree that that's an indication that this is not just something we forgive a few times in our life for the really hard and horrific stuff. Yeah. But what this seems to indicate as I was studying it because I needed mm -hmm. this, I started to realize, wow, forgiveness mm. and confession are supposed to be part of my daily routine. Yeah. And it has not been part of my daily routine. And I wonder if because confession and forgiveness has not been part of my daily routine, that that's why I'm carrying this heaviness in my heart. Yeah. Mm, and right. the way we get into an issue is often a clue of how we can get out of it. Yeah. So if I got into this realizing like, wow, I really haven't been incorporating confession and forgiveness on a daily basis, then maybe by realizing that I can implement including confession and forgiveness and it has started to lift the heaviness out of my heart.
Yeah, I mm. think um, it, is the saying "wash, rinse, repeat." Is mm. that right? I'm so the shampoo change. bottle. Yes, wash, yeah. rinse, shampoo know. bottle. Theology. I'm so impressed it, I, that I, you <laughs> just pulled that out from somewhere. Like I don't typically, know. it's sports analogies, right. but I'm having to nod my head. Like sure, it goes right from over. From sports whatever. to shampoo, we but are making progress here. Wash, <laughs> rinse, repeat. I have got that. Joel. You got that one. I've I got mean, it. Um, and I think we, what we want for forgiveness is to be a one and done. Wouldn't that be so nice? Be nice. Yep. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh -huh. uh, and this is what you're talking about is the fact, the impact, this consequence. Um, a couple things that I think is, is instructive of what Jesus says here. When he says, give us this daily bread, I want to think of the Israelites and the deep story that they have where they recollect. Because story, I just think of the Israelites kind of like us with campfires. We sit around a camp, you're going to tell stories. We tell stories of our families, things that we love. They're all instructing us in some way. And when Jesus says, give us this, our daily bread, for the Israelites, the people of God, they're thinking of the manna in the wilderness. And Lisa, you taught this once, and it was so profound. I remember as she speaks, listening to uh, one of your teachings. And I don't know how I have not thought about it. It was just so brilliant. You talked about the necessity for the manna to be on a daily basis. And as I think about the necessity for the manna to be on a daily basis, it brings us to the realization that if that manna could have sustained multiple days, it would have put the people in a position where they could have stopped trusting God and begin to trust in themselves. Mm -hmm. And the necessity of a dailiness of prayer, a necessity of, of looking to the Lord on a daily basis, it's actually forming our hearts, it's creating us to be a type of people that mm -hmm. recognize our limits that mm. realize that we are in deep need of a great God who is good and gracious and who can and does save us and that is the exact same thing that happens with the very next phrase of the idea of forgive us our debts uh, as we also have forgiven our debtors because it is an ongoing action and we are incapable I just believe we're incapable of doing this to the fullest degree aside from the power and the presence of the Spirit Amen. So here's um, a moment where I can practice confession, okay? So I'm just going to confess. You know this wow. is documented for yes. time of memorial. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> but here's what I want to confess. I find it much harder to forgive, sometimes even impossible to forgive, when my view of the situation is that I'm the saint and they are the sinner. Sure. And I think it's so important to recognize before Jesus says that we should also forgive people who have created emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever the debt is. People have hurt us, so now they have created a debt for us. Before we forgive other people, that we recognize our need to receive forgiveness from God, which helps me remember the same grace that I desperately need mm. is the grace that I should be all the more eager to give. Mm -hmm. And grace is not giving someone else permission to continue to hurt you. Grace is recognizing that you're human, I'm human, you hurt me because someone else has hurt you. So you are carrying burdens of hurt. And while I may not be able to have compassion on you because you've hurt me so much um, that would that would be hard to just muster sure. up compassion for the person that hurt you but I can have compassion on the hurt you must have suffered mm. that led you to making some of the decisions that you've made against me and I don't even have to know what hurt they have suffered mm. but I can always assume rightly most of the time we say don't assume things mm -hmm. but it's not a far stretch for me to remind myself that person has suffered hurt because every person has suffered hurt mm -hmm. and it's from their own places of hurt that they would then do something that would cause hurt to me mm -hmm. but it's so important first that I recognize God I need your forgiveness because if, if I am hesitant to recognize that I need God's forgiveness, or I only think that I need this much forgiveness from God, if I only think I need this much forgiveness from God, then I just let that little tiny bit of forgiveness flow to me, and I have very little forgiveness to then let flow through me. Right. 
But when I throw my arms open wide and say, God, I need mm -hmm. abundant forgiveness from you. Mm -hmm. When God's forgiveness flows to me in such abundance that he wants to give me in full abundance, his absolute forgiveness, when I let it flow to me, I can then let it flow through me. But so much of me remembering, I have done wrong too. Mm -hmm. And I need God's forgiveness. It, it shifts my mindset from I'm the saint, you're the sinner, to God has simply called us all to be servants. Mm -hmm. And I am not better or worse or worse or better. I am simply human. I'm a human who has the tendency to make mistakes. And when I can remember that I need grace, I can more freely give grace. When I remember I need forgiveness, I can more freely give forgiveness. And so that's part of this process. The order is important. I confess. And sometimes for me, when I sit before the Lord, I will say, speak to me, Lord. Yeah. Because I don't want to only bring my perspective to this issue. Okay. Like, speak to me, Lord, and help me see where maybe a word I said or a thought that I had has skewed my perception of this whole thing because more than proving that I'm right, I want to improve this relationship. Mm -hmm. But I often need God's help to bring to mind things that I probably wouldn't be capable of thinking of on my own. And so forgiveness does all of that good work for, mm -hmm. for the whole, uh, confession does all of that good work for this whole forgiveness process. Yeah. But also, I think, just for the sake of my heart, not for just the sake of our relationships, but for the sake of my heart, I like that. when I have things that I'm carrying in my heart that I haven't confessed by God, I'm carrying so much unnecessary weight. Mm. And I wonder why we aren't more eager to get rid of that weight with this beautiful provision that God has given us of confession. Why do you think that is? I think for one, uh, Duke University did a study a number of years ago that found that the number one killer in America was unforgiveness, bitterness. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do what I need to do to forgive you. I think in my experience, and at times I know this myself, by holding on to uh, unforgiveness and a sense of justice, uh, knowing as I turn the page of my Bible to Matthew 7, there's a little story about it, I think, and there's somewhere coming up, uh, uh, it's coming up about a log and in my own eye, it feels good. So I have this kind of self-righteousness by unforgiving. I feel like, it's not right, but I feel like I'm getting justice now. No way will I forgive you. Mm. And I then may be in my anger, uh, not even aware to go vertical to say, God, will you forgive me? So whether that's pride, but I think there's a real sense of immediate justice. I will not do this. And that's neurochemically, that's a jolt, that's an upper. I feel all this power inside. Wow. It's very powerful. It's toxic and deadly because it harms the container, me, that it's held in more than it does you that I need, who I need to forgive. But I think it's very functional to, to not forgive. Yeah, I think um, that question specifically, why? It's a good question. Why is it that, that we're hesitant to it? I wonder if, because there at times becomes a fami familiarity with that yeah. weight, mm. and even though it's crushing us, like I, I think of my own life, my own situations. At, at times, th this this is crushing me. But at least I know what it is. At least I can feel it. At least I can, you know. Uh, and over time, that becomes familiar to the point where, if I release this weight, and if I do what Jesus says, right, and and take His yoke upon myself, because His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Like if I were to do that, I still don't know how that's going to feel. And I don't have any familiarity with it. I don't know what that outcome is going to look at. And to some degree, I think it also means that I put myself at jeopardy and at risk because I don't know what the other person's response is. Mm -hmm. While I bear this weight, at least I'm in full control of what I'm going to do or what I'm not going to do. Wow. But the minute I, I open myself up, to allow this great exchange to take place, there is this moment, it's like a hand, I'm gonna give you the football illustration now. It's I like a handoff, it's like a handoff with football. I teach my sons all the time. That is the most important time when, you, time when you do the handoff, you watch the football go into the other person's hand and you imagine that thing going and being caught tight. 
um, because most fumbles happen in that exchange because there mm -hmm. is this this curiosity is that person going to grab it mm -hmm. am i going to release it when does that timing take place and i think there's a bit of fear that is wrapped around it i think you're right i think there is fear and i also really like what you said when we're holding on to the anger the bitterness the frustration the disappointment it does feel like i was powerless to make mm -hmm. sure you didn't hurt me. Mm -hmm. And now that you have hurt me, I am not gonna put myself in a position of powerlessness again. Yep. So if I hold on to all of this, this proof of how bad you've hurt me becomes a sense of power for me to remind you, but even more so remind myself, I will not let this person hurt me again. And even though I'm unaware in the moment that I'm really not powerful, but I, that's potent. I'm impotent. There, I'm lacking power. It feels like all this power, but in reality, I'm really out of control. It's far more chaos inside. Mm -hmm. It's a false power. Mm. Because when we're holding on to the pain, the pain really, I, I've said before, when, when the human heart lets hurt sit in it too long, it eventually turns to hate. Mm -hmm. And we can manage it with our words, but the raw feelings are still pain. And if we're holding on to pain, pain never grows and blossoms into yeah. beauty. Mm -hmm. It can only travel from pain to something else. We have to turn the pain from pain to perspective. Mm -hmm. Perspective is where the beautiful seeds mm -hmm. can yeah. grow mm -hmm. new thoughts new maturity new growth but pain can't grow that yeah. pain is too toxic of a soil pain yeah. will only grow more pain is really what you're saying it's right. exponential too it just keeps breeding more like the root of bitterness that scripture talks about but pain will just breed more and more pain kind of like weeds do in my yard i can spend money and time you know to to try to get the grass right and in fairness in case she's watching which she will my wife would do that <laughs> She loves the, taking care of the yard that way. But it's, I do nothing for the weeds to grow. It's like they're resilient. So I love what you're saying. That pain will just feed like weeds taking over a yard, choking out the life that is there. Mm -hmm. And even though we do have this false sense of power and maybe even out of fear, like you said, Joel, protection. Mm -hmm. Like if I hold on to this, it'll protect me from, not, from it not happening again. But what we don't realize is that it will leak out as a toxic atmosphere and affect mm -hmm. every other relationship that we're in. Because hurt from one relationship doesn't sit still and only come up in that relationship. It affects mm -hmm. us and it'll start impacting every other relationship that we have. And mm -hmm. it's a false sense of power because it cannot protect us and it cannot um, prevent that person from hurting us again. Yeah. And so, but I think when we allow the confession and forgiveness process to come about, just like what Jesus is teaching us in this prayer, I think that's where that pain can go through a process to become eventual perspective. Mm -hmm. And perspective is powerful. Mm -hmm. Perspective yes. is the, the, the maturity and the wisdom that we can bring into this dynamic that actually could help us uh, draw better boundaries, navigate future situations with this person if they never said they were sorry, if they were never willing to um, grow and mature in their part of what they've contributed to this relationship, then perspective can help me feel empowered enough to yeah. say, okay, I'm gonna draw a boundary here, not to shut you out, but to hold myself Thank together. Mm -hmm. And I think that perspective also can help us better navigate the fears because then we're bringing wisdom. Experiential wisdom is some of the best wisdom yeah. to bring into complicated situations to help inform us the navigation process that will be healthy. May I speak real quick too, and I know you've much to say on the very, one of the, the Greek word homologeo means to say the same thing as on confession. I think a lot of times in my experience, I, people I know or work with, they will admit things to God. I admit it. That's not a confession to agree with, say, say the same thing. And then when it comes to this uh, horizontal, that's the vertical between you and God, but the horizontal piece of going to a person saying this, is what I did. And a confession, 
not only do I agree, this is what I did. A, a confession should never be caveated. You'll catch it. I did this, but everything before the but really negates what just happened. Mm. So a confession mm. should not be caveated with God, but it's the home I grew up in, or, or you know, I was upset God, or, or to the person, you know, I, I did this to hurt you, but of course you did this, and it should not be caveated. I think there is, in my experience in the counseling world, there is a massive vacuum around authentic confession, both mm. vertically to God and horizontally to each other. Yeah, and I think in terms of our in our relationships with each other, within our families, within our relationships in the church, um, we have lost, uh, it seems like, the discipline and the practice of mutual confession of sins. Mm -hmm. um, because for the people of Israel in the Old Testament, this was all communal activity. Yeah. This was, we, we've, in our Western culture, we have um, individualized so much of how we look at scripture and we read it. And yet there would be a time when you would go to the temple and you would be, you would offer up communal confession of sin, not just for yourself, but for your people as a nation. We see this all the way throughout the minor prophets. You see um, the kings of Israel who'd come on behalf of the people, King Solomon, one of the most brilliant prayers at the temple dedication. And Nehemiah did it when he came before King Artaxerxes, I confess my sins and the sins of my fathers. And so I think what we have is when we're in the practice of confession, and when we're in the practice of forgiveness, like what Jesus is saying, this is some of the things that I'm thinking through. And Lisa, with your example of um, almost like soil, your heart is soil. And when you allow unforgiveness to settle into that heart, mm -hmm. into that soil, it actually um, uh, spoils that soil where fruit can't bear, right? It's going to always be stained. Almost like cement. Cement. Where Seeds can't even get in, and if they do get in, they can't flourish. And I even yeah. think about like that, like it takes a lot of hard work to till the ground. Yes. Like it is not an easy thing, you know? And I'm curious, I just think that confession and forgiveness is an act that we participate with the Lord that is actually forming our hearts and transforming us in order to be a type of people that can live in the kingdom of heaven that is coming to earth that can be a type of people that are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And I think it mm -hmm. is as a witness to a world that is desperate to see the hope of the kingdom. Um, and so th there's something about participating in confession, participating in the act of forgiveness when it's hard, that it's doing something inside of us to form us but it actually is also simultaneously is an act that's inviting other people outside to take part of the goodness that we've experienced. I, I would say in mm. my experience, the softer my heart is, the more set up it is to um, have beautiful things growing in mm. it. Soft hearts don't as easily break. Yeah. It's hard, riddle hearts that are more True. prone to getting broken. Yeah. Shattered, yeah. So how do we do this? Because I think we've made a strong case to do it, but how do we do it? And so in the book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget, I decided that I needed a system. I'm a real systems person, <laughs> and so you can convince me to do something, but if I don't have a system to implement it, then it probably won't get done. So the best way if my heart has been hardened about something the best way for truth to break through is god's word mm. and me getting into god's word and letting god's word get into me starts to tenderize me in a way that very few other things can and so mm -hmm. i decided to look up some verses that dealt with relational issues or topical issues from situations that I've been through and just list out some of those verses. And then in my journal, I decided to take myself through this system. And so maybe this will help. I started to write down, I wrote down these words, progress, suppress, digress, regress, confess, forgiveness. So it's six words. Hmm. So first progress. I read the verse and I say, where am I making progress with this mm. verse? And typically I can think of some situation, some relationship where I am making progress with this verse. Then second, suppress. What is a situation where I'm feeling resistant to living out this verse? So then the next word I write is digress. 
Is there a situation where I'm taking steps backwards with this verse? So I'm not just feeling resistant to live it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually doing the opposite of what this verse says. Mm -hmm. And then regress. Where am I living in rebellion against this verse? Mm -hmm. Well, once I take myself through those words, progress, suppress, digress, regress, now I have something to confess. And that so, flows right down, isn't that amazing, yes. down to confess. Yes. And so yeah. then, now that, I've written, now that I'm at the word confess, I'll say, now that I'm aware of some confessions I need to make, as I write these out, I will ask God to give me a spirit of humility in this process. And then the last step is forgiveness. Because oftentimes, as I'm confessing, I'll start having something come to my mind. Well, well wait, God, wait. There's this person who isn't living out this verse with me mm -hmm. and so i say okay we'll tend to that in a minute i'm going to set that on the shelf and finish my confession now the last word forgiveness where is someone not living this verse with me this is an opportunity for to for me to forgive it doesn't excuse their behavior it frees me from being hindered by unforgiveness and so once again, this is just a system that works for me. You guys may have your own system. You may have your own system and that's great. But I needed a way not just to say, Love yeah, it. I should confess or yeah, I should be practicing daily forgiveness. But if I really want to implement the daily cure for a heavy heart, I take myself into God's word and I say progress, suppress, digress, regress, confess, forgiveness. And doing that and writing that out in my journal has really helped me to practically apply what we've been talking about. And for about. me, if I get to apply just Jimbo here by himself, then that leads me to wholeness. Mm -hmm. Wow, at I the love end. that. Just a wholeness of yes, designed to be ever more moving toward wholeness when at times clear back from childhood and unforgiveness keeps me in, in, in a place that's very painful and a place that's, a place that's toxic. And I want to embrace wholeness in my life. But I love your system, by the way. Thank you. That is in the book? That's in the book. Okay, because it flows down. And I just said, for me, so my personal application so is wholeness. Yeah, and I long for wholeness. Man, do I long for it. And once you get past the confession and forgiveness, I love adding the word wholeness. But now you can go right back up to the top of the chart. And now I'm making progress. Ross, rinse, and repeat. Right? right. There you, you go. go. There you up, go. See? Look how you Look did that. that. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Joel? You know, I just think about, uh, and not to get too cheesy here, but since we're going with all the, the, the wholeness and confess, I think that when you're whole and you've done this practice, it puts you in a posture and a position to experience God's goodness. And I, I really that. think that's what we're desperate for. I we agree. We want to experience the goodness of God. And what if, when we confess, when we do acts of forgiveness, that it positions us in a posture to truly experience the goodness of God. Holiness, even. Mm -hmm. Seriously, it's not cheesy, mm -hmm. even if into that, and I long for that one, too. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today mm -hmm. for this episode of Therapy and Theology. Uh, one challenge I want to give you, don't just listen and think, yeah, that's a good idea. Take what we've given you and implement it however it works in the situations in your life because we don't wanna just give you the truth. We wanna help you know the truth so you can live the truth because we're convinced it changes everything.